actually know who's going to be next. <laughs> Unfortunately, he's had to cancel. <laughs> uh, no, I can't do that to you. He's here. He's backstage. He's ready for you. Are you ready for him? Say it again for me. 
revealing more family secrets. <laughs> well, we thank you for Gish. Thank you. Uh, it's a lot of fun and it brings out a lot of interesting qualities of Gelp people and it's a lot of fun. Yeah, a lot and, of people's worst qualities. <laughs> and, um, I was just trying to think of something fun to ask you because you like to seem like you like to mess with your fans on Twitter a lot. Uh huh. And I need to know the answer to. Did you go back and get your AirPod? Out of the urinal? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to ask you What do you think? <laughs> I'm trying to give you advice and tell you not to. So we were hoping that was the right way. The right choice? <laughs> to leave an expensive piece of high-tech equipment for other people to urinate on? <laughs> That's a terrible thing to do. No, I simply wipe it off and put it back. Auction it off? It's not. Okay. That's a great Good idea. Save. Let's just see how fucked up my fans are. That would be what I would be testing them. <laughs> It's not even. No. I'm, uh, <laughs> that's a great response to the lighting cue, folks. Okay, let's take a look. Oh, yeah, it's very, isn't it? Uh, uh, I, um, I recently put my AirPods through the laundry. <laughs> Again. And one of them still worked. It's so amazing. And then I have to bring it back to the Apple Store. This shows what kind of integrity I have. I brought it to the Apple Store because I had the warranty on it. If anybody works at Apple, maybe don't run this up the black hole at work. Um, <laughs> and I said, there's something wrong with my AirPod. The, the left one is not working. And he was like, oh, all right, let's check it out. Any water damage? I said, I don't think so. <laughs> It must have been the dryer that did it. <laughs> I don't know how you're supposed to follow up with that. Yes. <laughs> Hi. Hi. So we all have that one song that we listen to on repeat, like mine is Aha, Take On Me. Yeah. What is yours? I don't have one. Um, but I recently listened to a podcast about people who have songs stuck in their head on loop and it never stops. And apparently that's a thing. And then I brought it up with a friend and they were like, do you not have songs? <laughs> and so luckily, because I listened to this podcast, I was able to diagnose a friend with a serious psychological disorder. Hi, what, what do I have stuck in my head? Okay, that's not a song with us. That's none of your business. <laughs> <laughs> this is where private things happen. Um, I used to, when I, when, you know, I, I was just reflecting that I want to get um, uh, a record player in because I love actually listening to albums and I don't actually do it that much when I'm listening to my, you know, listening to music on, on iTunes or whatever. It's more like stuff is a random play. Um, but there's something really nice about like, listening to a whole album back in the day. And when I was a kid, I had a record player and I had maybe a dozen LPs. Like I didn't have a lot of records. So I would play the same things like Led Zeppelin and the Rolling Stones and Buffy St. Marie and a few other things that basically had my mother's hand me down records from you know, the 70s, and that was my music genre, my real bona fide 70s hippie. Um, the Beatles, that was what I was about. But it was kind of great, because you really got to know those same songs on the beat. My kids, uh, my, my daughter will listen to uh, Fireworks, 
Katie Perry. And not uh, it's unending. Um, and then my son will he, he wants to, he just wants to play all of the the songs from Hamilton. Mm. He knows every word of every song. And I, and Mason would scream at the sound of Hamilton, like acid is being splashed in their face. <laughs> so it's a constant source. It's funny, your question is actually bringing up a lot of like family trauma. <laughs> so I'm always like, Um, so I'm really a great parent. <laughs> yeah. Music, they say, brings people together, but in my house, it just drives a wedge between us. <laughs> Hi. You want it? I want mm -hmm. it. Wow. Yeah. Entertainment is amazing. They say enter to win, and I was one of the lucky ones. Really? Um, you're... <laughs> that was good advertising for creation. <laughs> creation entertainment is amazing. It saved my life. Um, it's very nice. But, uh, but now I want to ask you a question. So okay. First of all, I love the yes day. I see you in Insta. That was awesome. You with makeup with great. Oh, thank you. I look good as a clown. <laughs> so my it was funny because this. my kids were like, this, okay, so recently I posted a photo. I'm sorry, I'm cutting you off for a second. So recently, my, uh, I, we used to do this thing when my kids were really little of, of doing something called Yes Day. And Yes Day would be, just be like, I would just follow the thread that the kids, you know, whatever the kids wanted to do, if they wanted to go bowling, we'd go bowling. If they wanted to go to the playground, we'd go to the playground. And so I was about, it was like, a, I don't know, the day or two before I had to drop them off for school, and then, I, I, then I'm, you know, relocating to Atlanta where it's going to be, I'm not going to be seeing them as much, so I just wanted to give them a little special time. I was like, let's do a yes day. You guys have hard lunch. And they were like, ah, oh, this is so nice, Dad. We're just gonna fuck you today. <laughs> and so everything we did that day was actually just about tormenting me. <laughs> so it was like, first we're doing the makeover, and as they were doing it, I was like, those are strange colors for a makeover, and also those aren't, that's not makeup. That's paint. <laughs> While Mason is like painting my face and West is occasionally jabbing something in my eyeball, uh, he's, he's down here with a pair of scissors cutting my leg hair. <laughs> and I'm just like, oh, great. I have to say yes to this, huh? <laughs> we had very few rules. One of them was you couldn't, um, you couldn't do something uh, to, to your sibling as like part of the yes day. And, of course, and like we laid out these rules in advance because I'm not an idiot. Yeah. But I didn't do it for myself. I, there was nothing in there to protect me because I was just thinking about them torturing one another. Idiot. Go ahead. I laughed a lot. I was very lucky to do that. Uh, my question is kind of serious. Uh, being in the show as I'm still uh, close to God, do you have a particular inclination to any people's spiritual belief? energy and religion. And you don't have to answer either one to I but since I get a question I ask you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you for asking that question. Um, it's a it's a funny thing in, in this modern world with so many diverse uh, spiritual paths that people can take. And it's interesting just hearing you ask that question that it is a it's a realm that can be private. Which is I, I I don't often reflect on that, but it's not a it's not like a cocktail party opener, you know. <laughs> often people say like, what do you do for a living? But they don't say, what's your what's your religious practice? <laughs> um, but I uh, I'm happy to answer your question. 
I think I consider my I consider myself, I don't know why I'm hedging. I consider myself a Buddhist. Um, but Buddhism in as far as I understand it, in its pure form is not really a religion, it's more of a science of life and a practice. I do a lot of meditating. <clears throat> um, but I think the core principle of Buddhism that is a guiding light for me is that if you really pay attention and stay present and, and can really be in touch with what's going on in your body and in your mind, then you can actually use that as a guidepost to making good decisions in your life. And when you when you aren't making good decisions in your life, it's because you're not really paying attention. And um, the, the more you practice and the more you meditate, um, the, better, the better your life gets, but also the more positive impact you have on other people. That's basically like, like distilling it to its core is, is what Buddhism is, is about. But it also um, allows for a mystical and an unknown um, aspect of the spiritual realm. So it's not so much necessarily um, personifying a god. Like it's not like there's someone that's uh, that's sitting up there behind the early gates on a on a cloud throne. But um, but it allows for uh, expressions of the unknown, which is also very simple. Thank you, Michelle. That was very yeah. insightful. Um, and my question is, if you had to choose a day on set, which day would you choose to live again and what happened that day? Um, hold on one second. I just wanted to add one thing to that last comment, which is that, I, um, that there are a lot of, a lot, I know a lot of Buddhists who are also like priests and practicing Christians or like there are, there are people who belong to other religions who also practice the tenets of Buddhism. Um, so I really do think that it's something that, that is outside of, of the realm of religion, per se. I don't know. It's not, not necessarily important. Um, what day would I, would I live on repeat on Supernatural? Uh, is there another question that I can answer? <laughs> I felt uh, bad for James up here. The last question he got was, who, who do you like more, Jared or Jensen? I can ask, I can ask you that question. And I'm sure he could have answered, like, who do you dislike more? But that's much easier to answer, right? Um, I think, like, what's your worst day on Supernatural? I could answer that one. Um, I, I don't know. <laughs> You know, it's funny, my last day on Supernatural was like this um, unbelievable emotional roller coaster for me. We, <clears throat> the last day of shooting was also the last scene for, for Castiel, you know, makes his declaration of love and then gets taken away by the empty. Um, it was saying goodbye to a character, saying goodbye to the crew and the cast. It was the last scene shot at the end of the night on a Friday after a long week of shooting. And <clears throat> when I was done, I would go home and never come back to the Supernatural set. I didn't know that at the time, because at the time there was a plan for me to come back in the last episode, but COVID shut that down and they had to rewrite that last script. Um, and I, um, I got like to an emotional level in that on that day of shooting that I don't remember getting to on Supernatural. Like, it was really, like, I was feeling all of those feelings. And, and it was all enmeshed. I was saying goodbye to the cast and the crew, or to, and Cass was saying goodbye to Dean, and I was saying goodbye to Cass. Um, and after working on a character, embodying a character for 12 years, it kind of starts to add up. Um, so it was super intense. And then, um, we all went to you know our trailers after finishing, and then uh, the, the first day he said, "Hey, Mish, uh, there's uh, something we wanted to wrap up. Uh, one one thing we forgot up on, on set, so we went up to the kind of letter set, and it was like a little surprise goodbye. And they they did uh, they put together like this past this retrospective 
video on a big monitor of like Castiel's moments and some of my moments in the last 12 years. And I it was a cake. We all said goodbye. And then that night, we were flying to a convention in Vegas. And COVID was just starting, and everybody was like, should we be doing a convention? It wasn't like things weren't shut down yet, but it was starting to get like, maybe custody. And then you got on a plane, and they had to, they had to charter a flight that night because we, like, we were shooting so late and had to be there so early in the morning the next day that there was no commercial flights to get us there in time. So we got on this plane, took off, and we flew for about 20 minutes, and then there was this blinding light and explosion. And then the plane started shaking like this. One of the engines had literally blown up. Like the metal was like shredded on the engine. And then we had to turn around and do this emergency landing. And as we were coming back in to land, we'd see this like six fire engines on the tarmac. And it's like two o'clock in the morning when we're coming down. And as we got into cell reception, low enough for cell reception, all of us were like texting, like, tell the kids I love them, because we didn't know we were going to die. So it was like this, this, the whole night was, the whole day was just this amazing, like I actually then also literally basically said goodbye to my kids, because I didn't know, we didn't know if we were going to survive the land. I mean, it was pretty, like, it was not in good shape. We got outside and looked at it, and it was like, oh my God, mangled metal. Um, so that day, it's, it's not really one that I would want to live again, and I'm not <laughs> But, it, like, I also am somebody who likes to chase experiences and feel things intensely, and that day, check all the boxes. <laughs> <laughs> there you have it. It's a non-answer to a good question. Hi. Uh, I'm Gabrielle. Um, so, you gave me and my sister perhaps the weirdest compliment we've ever received. <laughs> You're welcome. The, the weirdest compliment you've ever received. What was the compliment that I gave you? Um, so it was back at the Tower Tower when you did the signing, and uh -huh. we like moved seats to accommodate for somebody, and you told us um, we were real humanitarians who deserved a higher place in the afterlife, which is very kind, but like a very strong thing to say. So, <laughs> thanks, but whoa. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Where's the most beautiful place you've ever hiked? 
Um, I just went on a beautiful hike in the mountains uh, here yesterday. Um, we have some, I don't know if you know this, but there's some really nice mountains around here. Um, my dad took, well, I, he wanted to take me and my brother to, on a little tour to see the, like, the stopping grounds from his childhood. And so he took us up to Long's Peak. And we did some like scramble, we went, out, went off the trail and did some scrambling on a boulder field and started this like avalanche on the boulder field. And like the, all, the, this was the most terrifying thing because like go look up, up, up like a quarter of a mile above us and below us. We were just in this big mass of rocks that were like 45 degree angle. And it all started moving under us. And we were just like scrambling to stay on the top of the surface of these rocks that were like slowly shifting under us. It was the most terrifying thing. Um, that was awesome. <laughs> um, I did a, a hike um, in, on the Annapurna circuit in Nepal that was just mind-blowingly beautiful. Um, and you come around these like these little beautiful like, grassy ravines where they had these tiny little rock stone huts where they were grinding grain on little water pools with these tiny little streams, like only 12 inch wide little streams that would, one grain would drop at a time, very slowly on this old stone wheel. And they're just like grinding away un unmanned in the Himalayas. That was amazing. And the Pali Coast Trail in uh, Hawaii. It's really beautiful. Um, I took a hike uh, from the rim of the Grand Canyon, also with my father, because this is my dad's day, I guess. Um, so the rim of the Grand Canyon, and uh, we were there in the summer, and all there were all of these signs that say, do not attempt to hike down to the, the river and back up in one day. And so I was like, hey, I'm going to go down to the river, guys. And my dad was like, I'll go with you. And he was in his 60s at the time. And so we started at like 2 o'clock in the afternoon. We got down <laughs> to the river very quickly. Like, it was maybe 6. And then turned around. It was like a 20-mile loop. And we brought <laughs> no water. Oh, oh my god. My dad was in his like boating shoes. <gasps> And he's not, he wasn't in great shape. And um, so it was like, whatever, one o'clock in the morning, no flashlight. He is trudging up the hill in front of me and he's doing like one foot in front of the other at this pace. And then he starts going like this with his right hand. And I was like, dad, what are you doing? And he said, uh, I just can't feel my fingers. And I had just finished this hand course. So I was a certified EMT, but I really didn't pay attention. <laughs> and I was like, shit, Dad, I think that means you're having a heart attack. Which, by the way, if you think someone's having a heart attack on a trail in the middle of nowhere, you don't tell them that. <laughs> but I had this vague recollection that that might be something of having a heart attack, but then I started running in circles because I was like, but I don't remember what you're supposed to do. <laughs> Super helpful, but I do. <laughs> Eventually, Rangers found us. He was fine. <laughs> he was fine. He was probably a very mild heart attack. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Hi. Hi, Misha. I'm Sean. Hi, Sean. How are you? Uh, Go again. So we hear at the cons a lot um, that commonly a lot of people come up and show you that they have tattoos of you on their person. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. what I'd like to know is, uh, if we were to find out that Misha Collins has a tattoo of his favorite celebrity, uh -huh. who would that celebrity be? And where would he find the tattoo? Uh, well, I, I'm somebody who has generally speaking a lot of empathy, and 
I did, I did, I did an item in Dish where I, uh, I did many items over the years in Dish, my staff there, where I encouraged people to, to get tattoos in exchange for points, which are basically mm -hmm. worthless. Yeah. <laughs> in the scavenger hunt, and one year I finally had them get a, a tattoo of the Pope. Yeah. So there are a lot of people that have yeah. tattoos of the Pope on their asses. <laughs> and I want to say a lot, probably thousands. Yeah. <laughs> and I saw that and I felt a little bit of compunction, because what a horrible thing to do to someone. <laughs> And uh, and then I see these tattoos of like you know people have tattoos of my face, um, and I think oh you know why why would you do that? But I get it, you know that makes sense. Um, so in sort of an act of empathy, I, I have had a tattoo of my own face on my ass. useful because if I, if, I, if I ever happen to be naked, like a lot of people don't really know other people by, by their like, weird views. <laughs> and so it's a handy reminder, really. Like if somebody doesn't have to look at my face to know who I am, I'm like, this is, that's, that's me. <laughs> and, I, and I did a tattoo of me and it's sort of like winking. So it's like, mm -hmm. I know you're checking my naked ass out. I see you. So it's just, it's also practical. Yeah. Oh my god. Um, Picks or didn't Wouldn't that be amazing if you did it? Then show the canvas! I, I also like the idea of that just being because I'm a caring person. That's why I did it. It's empathy that, that, that got me to get a tattoo of my own face on myself. Um, does anyone have a Pope tattoo here? Oh, thank God. <laughs> I'm well. About the, I know after the yes day that you had the kids, you went to Atlanta to start shooting Gotham Nights. How has that experience been for the last two weeks compared to, you know, you played as the Apple so long and it was such a part of you? You know, you're playing Harvey Dent and it's all new. Well, the, the, I, so I've started filming a new show uh, called Gotham Nights. I'm playing Harvey Dent, which is exciting. <laughs> it's really cool because it's just, you know, my character about my universe. And, um, and I, Tommy Lee Jones is one of my favorite actors. Um, he played Harvey Dent. I wasn't actually, I thought he did a totally terrible job with Harvey Dent. <laughs> it's his career worst performance, but I love, I love Tommy Lee Jones. Um, and it's, it's very cool to play a character that is human. <laughs> Because there was something about Castiel that was like everything was filtered through this this almost alien persona, and so it's, I'm able to like dial in and connect uh, uh, as a as a human, which is really cool. But also, this is a very complicated human, and um, and we're getting to explore that. I have to be very careful because I keep getting in trouble for spoiling it. Um, it's a, it's a fascinating character and a very complicated character very quickly in the series, um, which is really just super fun to play. Um, yeah, I, I like it. And it's also, so, and then in compare, comparing this to like the experience on Supernatural, like on set, um, the, 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 these cast, like all the rest of the cast members are just super excited to be there and they're working their butts off and everybody is just bringing their A game every day on set so far and that's been really cool and like while we're filming the scenes there's there's no one tickling my balls with a broom <laughs> and so that 
that makes it easier to dial in to the actual material. Um, now I gotta say that I don't like there are aspects of that that I miss, you know. <laughs> Certainly there are. <laughs> It was, it, it, was, it was a perk of the job, I have to say. Um, there have been a couple of scenes where I've been like, <laughs> just waiting for it to come, and it, and it doesn't, I'm like, great, I have to readjust to this new work environment. <laughs> we do this at, uh, like at, every, at the beginning of every uh, year on every set, uh, there's a sexual harassment seminar. <laughs> and I'm looking back on my experience on Supernatural. <laughs> I should have raised my hand on year four. But let me ask a quick question. Is it cool if, uh, like if it's a broom handle in you? Is that a thing? <laughs> they ask, it's like being in a classroom, you know, and they ask, the participants like, so here's a scenario. Some, some, um, some uh, teamsters are, are standing by the water cooler talking about a, a sexual experience they had the weekend before, and a uh, cast member walks nearby and overhears it. Does, does that constitute? Does that does that constitute sexual harassment? And people are raising their hands and weighing in. I would love to present. Um, but I won't. Bright presentation here. Thank that's you. very nice. You <laughs> enunciate you. well. I appreciate it. Thank yeah. you. So my daughter cannot be up here. Do you work in animation voiceover? I is... should. My yes, my husband should. actually calls me a Disney princess. Oh so, really? Yeah. He oh, yes. He nice. says I wake up and I hit the ground running and the bunnies and the birds help me with the laundry in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. Well, how did you train them? <laughs> Magic. <laughs> anyway, so I'm asking this question on behalf of my daughter. Okay. So my daughter created a Sam and Dean playlist for when they are driving in the car. So if Cass is driving with them, what would he listen to? Well, I actually have an answer for this because when I was uh, when I got the role of Castiel, I had just taken this acting class, and they were like, "You should when you're when you're like developing the character, you should really immerse yourself in all of the aspects of the character. And think about things like you know their past childhood and their relationship with the other characters and the kind of music they listen to." And so I started listening to Rock Monomov's Vespers, and and I was like, "Well, that I guess is Castiel's music." And then it actually stopped weirdly, and I was like, that actually really fits. Because yeah. it's, it's actually very, very, I love them, really lovely pieces. Um, but that was the answer. Yeah, I love uh, it. Thank until you. Until Cass started watching television and <laughs> <laughs> was singing the greatest uh, theme song to the world. Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, fun fact in the original script um, <clears throat> for that episode where Castiel is taking care of a baby, I don't know if you remember or if you've ever even watched the show, but um, <laughs> Castiel was supposed to like, be trying to soothe the, the baby back to sleep, and the only song that he could think of in the first version of the script was Highway to Hell. So he said, Highway to Hell to baby, which I, I had to like, I practiced singing Highway to Hell in a lullaby form. Quite funny, but then it turns out they were going to have to pay a hundred thousand dollars for the rights to oh. the song. But they could do the uh, theme song to the Greatest American Hero because it was a Warner Brothers show. <laughs> Mercury. So that's what we
That's amazing. Is there a level of you will not make us go, like has an item been submitted that you have said no, we will not put them through that? <laughs> or one that you thought you, was that level and we did it anyway? What, what kind of a person do you think I am? <laughs> There have been a lot of items um, that, the, the, certainly, yes, of course, we do items all, all the time. There's a, there's a curation process, like the, the list all year long, I go to have things crop up at a conversation at dinner and I'll take a note and be like, well, that would be a great fish item. Um, I would love to see, you know, human remains spread all over a birthday party or something like that. <laughs> and then later, when we're reviewing the list, I can look at it again and say, oh, Maybe that's not a great <laughs> item. Where would they find the body? You know. Um, so, um, but we have a process, and we try to filter things out as much as possible. Like, oh, is that going to be like incredibly offensive, incredibly dangerous, or illegal? Those are some of the things that we filters that we apply. Sometimes things slip through, and people have been court martialed for doing dish items. Sadly, and I feel bad about that. But. You know, they were getting useless points, so. Uh, they, uh, I think it was maybe the first or second, I mean the first year or second year of Gish, right around in there, uh, there, was, there was an item that was like a fully decorated Christmas tree that's yeah. levitated with uh, helium balloons, and you had to get a lot of balloons to like, get a uh, Christmas tree to float. But of course, uh, th then they just keep floating. And then regional airports have to shut down because of Christmas trees in the airspace. <laughs> Which I know is super dangerous. Someone's gonna get, you know, someone's gonna get maimed or killed. Uh, but I was super proud of that. <laughs> there was another, speaking of Christmas trees, there was another item that was also year one or year two, which was wrap yourself in Christmas tree lights and stand on the peak of a roof at night. <laughs> and the first, <laughs> the first submissions came back, and it was this three-story house with a slate roof and a steep peak on the roof. And there was somebody completely tangled up in Christmas tree lights wrapped all around them. And I immediately sent out an email like, do not, everyone, that item is canceled. Because there's no way there would have been a 100% survival rate on that item. <laughs> And then the kids like will throw items in the, in, in the list, and one was like a, 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 an actual boat on an actual airplane flying. And then a lot of people who are, are like pilots or whatever, they wrote in complaints about that item because people were going to die. So we took it out. <laughs> seriously. 
every scene. I was like really in it, trying to do my best job. And then at one point we were toward the end of filming, and I was talking to the director, who was also the writer, who had also done a lot of other movies for the Sci-Fi Channel, which I guess these get aired on Saturday night. And the notes that he would get back from the Sci-Fi Channel were, you have to make this dumber, and you have to have no plot. Because this people watch this, and as they're watching, they're watching it as it, as it airs live, and they're all getting drunker and drunker as, <laughs> as, as the screen goes on. People are all playing drinking games while they watch this, and they have to be able to come, we have to be able to come back from a commercial break and have people not remember anything that happened before <laughs> and still sort of be able to follow what's going on. So that was the material that we were working on. <clears throat> You bought it. I did, yeah. It was like five bucks on Prime, so it's okay. <laughs> you paid too much. Yeah. Yeah. It's five dollars, I understand. Um, we were snubbed by the Oscars. <laughs> I'll say that. I don't know what happened. I think we were, we were ahead of our time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Amy from Minnesota. Hi, Amy. And my question is, if Cass had to swap out his trench coat for a different coat, what kind of coat would it be? Probably another trench coat. <laughs> Which is exactly what Cass did. <clears throat> when I got on Supernatural, um, I went in for a fitting, and I thought I was going to be there for a couple of episodes. And they threw me in this. It was The, the description of the character was like a rumpled suit, uh, kind of like a disheveled tax account with um, with a trench coat a la Constantine. So, like, this template was like, kind of looked a little bit like Constantine, but a little, little frumpy. So, they put me in this suit and did not fit at all. Luckily, I had this trench coat, which also didn't fit. It was way too big. But everything was just way too big. My shirt size was like, I wore a 15 and a half, and it was an 18. Oh. So, it was like, like billowing out like this. But I would always just like, tuck it in, and like fold and then fold again in the back, and then I the care I didn't make, I didn't try a second suit on or a second shirt on. I just went in and they were like, I was like whatever, it's a couple episodes, who cares? And then three years later, <laughs> I'm still wearing the exact same stuff that does not fit at all. And I finally went into wardrobe and I'm like, I'm sorry to be a cane, but this doesn't fit at all. And they were like took off the trench coat. Oh my god, why didn't you say something? <laughs> and also we're shooting in Vancouver in the winter and I had like on these basically like men's slippers, these tiny like little dress shoes that my feet were always, they were too small and my feet were always freezing. So they're like, why didn't you say something? So they put me in a pair of blundstones, which are like these big Australian boots and then changed my suit and then I was like, ah, it still, it still looks really frumpy. So then I, I wrote an email to the showrunners, and I was like, it's just, can I just look a little, like, like, like have something that's a little better fitting? Can we just change it somehow? And, I, and they were like, sure, sure, yeah, we'll work that out. So I came back for the next season uh, and did a fitting, and they had an all new trench coat and all new suit. Like, and it was actually like better fitting and like a little bit, a little bit more modern. I was like, that's cool. No mention of it in the script. Cass just suddenly went out shopping and got a whole new wardrobe the beginning of season eight or whatever it was, and no mention of it whatsoever. Isn't that great? <laughs> because they know the audience is not paying attention. <laughs> and then we did it again. We did it with my tie. Changed my tie, took the tie off, put the tie on. There's no mention of anything. It's just fine. Nobody cares. <laughs> Without, without, oh. You don't see me without the trench coat. That's right. <laughs> you did, did you notice the change in the in the trench coat though? Yes. You did notice. Uh, yes. Did you watch the whole show? <laughs> Five times. <laughs> wow, it's amazing. Um, the trench coats are ranked. Yeah. What is the ranking? There's three, right? I had three. Yeah. Huh. All right. The original was the best, so why did I mess with it? The 
good question. Yeah. Um, th thanks for asking. I think the answer, though, is just drink more ginger beers. Hi. Um, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. Um, so my question is about Gotham Knights, and you've been filming for like a couple of weeks, maybe a week, and I was wondering, because you're kind of like a show veteran by now, because you've been on Supernatural for so long, like, what's the dynamic, dynamic on set? Like, like, do the younger actors, like, talk to you or ask you questions about stuff? Yeah, that's funny. Nobody does talk to you. <laughs> I wonder what that's about. Um, I actually have only filmed uh, a couple of days. Uh, we were doing we were doing a lot of prep, like uh, fight training and wardrobe fittings, and you know just getting to know each other, and, uh, a couple of rehearsals, things like that. Um, and it's it's so it's so fascinating to be at that at that stage of life where I'm I'm the seasoned veteran, and there are these young actors who are coming in. A lot of the cast members, the cast members, other Regular cast members range in age from uh, 17 to 29, um, and but they're most mostly early 20s. Um, so it's it's funny. I I still think of myself as being youthful <laughs> and having like a long life ahead of me, um, and it turns out to not be the case. Um, <laughs> they think of me as super old, and I have to recalibrate. Um, like, all right, I am actually old enough to be any of their father, which is strange. And maybe the 17 year old I could pull off grandfather, I think. Um, so it's, uh, it's, 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 it's cool though. Um, I, <clears throat> when I joined Supernatural, um, I was, look, Jared and Jensen, were, they were very early on, sort of, that they passed on a few things. Like, be, be gracious to the crew, don't be an asshole, you know? I, I, things that um, show up knowing your lines, like show up carrying your weight. Um, there are a lot of times when people, <clears throat> when you're a, a, a lead cast on a TV show, the whole apparatus is designed to uh, cater to prima donnas. Because if, a, if an actor wants to throw a monkey wrench in the works and not come out of their trailer, they can bring production to a grinding halt. And so everyone tiptoes around actors, everyone dotes on actors, everyone gives them everything that they want and ask for, and, and it can kind of go to your head really quickly. And so it's good for there to be someone around to say, don't let it go to your head, still keep being a good person. Because it just becomes toxic and unpleasant to work in an environment where people are like start to believe that they're actually better than other people because they're getting this kind of special treatment. They're only getting a special treatment because other actors have been assholes in the past. And um, and we're all just working together to try to make a project as good as we can. And we all depend on one another. I mean it's incredible how much uh, the entire crew depends on each individual on set. If anyone isn't pulling their weight, the whole thing starts to crumble. Um, so, I don't know, I'm, 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 I'm trying to um, impart a little bit of that message, um, and I'm also trying to encourage them to figure out ways to get as much as they can for free out of production. <laughs> so it's a, it's, a, it's a balance of like trying to figure out how to exploit the system, but also appear to be kind when you do that. Thank you so much. Yeah. I just want to say thank you for being such a beautiful person, both uh, professionally and in your personal life. Just thank you. Um, well, thank you for having such a subdued haircut. <laughs> <laughs> um, my question for you is, cast has so many different variants, uh, just all sorts of different personalities throughout the series, and I'm just curious, which is your favorite version of cast, or which one was like, the hardest to adapt to? There, uh, but the favorite, I, well, first of all, my favorite is Castiel Castiel, just because I actually, it's, it's the only time I've actually come to love a fictional character. Like, it was just, it was like, oh my God. Um, and it's such a weird thing, but it's, it's actually a terrific point. Like, he became a, a, a real thing to me. Um, 
But I really love playing with Lucifer. I don't know what that says about me, but there was just something about that that I loved. Mark Pellegrino, who had sort of set the table for that character, um, told me, like, in, in every scene, when I go to every scene, I'm, I'm looking at the other characters thinking, I either want to kill them or fuck them. And I was like, well, that'll be fun. Great. Um, and then there was one that was really challenging, uh, it was Crazy Pass. I never figured that out. Uh, I remember getting on set for the first day. Ben Edlund was the writer and producer at that time, who also uh, was directing that episode. And we went into like, the first scene, and he was like, okay, so let's, let's try it where you're like really manic and really crazy and like really like, clappishly crazy. So we did a take, and he was like, he came back in, and he was like, okay, let's try one where you're really subdued and really casual. And it was like the opposite note. And then we did another take, and then he was like, oh, I don't know. And then <laughs> walked away with, uh, with my confidence completely shattered, and also me not knowing what the hell I should be doing with this character. But, you know, in, in TV, there's no, there's no time, like, you don't spend a lot of time rehearsing. You come to, to set, and you basically go through, you go through it once for a blocking rehearsal, so the camera's know where to go, and then you start filming. And that's it. And so there we were, filming, but I didn't know what I was doing, and I kept looking at Ben, and he kept being like, <laughs> Right. So, yeah, that one was fun. Thanks. Um, I'm Savannah, and I just wanted to, uh, to start off saying that some things I still can't tell you is beautiful, wonderful, and super powerful. And I'm a poet myself, so I just kind of wanted to ask you, like, what is your creative process when you start writing a poem? Is it like a memory, a line, and then you go with it, or a feeling? Um, I think that it's usually, there's some little, like, germ up, there's some little seed of some experience, it's usually some experience that then, um, just starts to coalesce as a vague idea in my head, and I will just see if I can put it down as a poem, and, um, most of the time it doesn't really work out to be a poem, or not a poem that I would want to share, um, but I like that process, it's almost like, it's almost like seeing there's something there, and then see if I can scrape the dirt away from it and, and see if it's a pretty thing or not. You know what I mean? Um, but it's like there, I catch a glimmer in the, in the you know, dark recesses of my mind. I'm like, maybe there's something there. Um, I've been having, it's, it's, uh, it's hard for me to go away from the kids, so this decision to go film in Atlanta while they're in Southern California has been like a little fun for me. It's bringing up a lot of emotions that are then like poking at me in a way that. that me to sit down and write about it. I think part of it is just like reflective uh, free therapy that I can you know, conduct on myself. Um, and part of it is just wanting, wanting to find some way to convey, even if only to myself, uh, these, to, to like articulate the feelings that are coming up. Um, and then one other thing that happens to me quite often with, with poems is that when I'm running, um, like out running in a, in a park or something, um, my brain kind of shut, tends to shut down, and then sometimes the poems just come to me. Also, the recipes come to me while I'm running, and it's like all of a sudden my mouth starts watering, and I'm like, that would be a great combination. I'm doing that tonight. So I don't know. It's weird. It's like when there's a when there's a certain space in my mind, sometimes things and just like crop up. Hi. I don't want to move you today. It's not, I really like that. Don't encourage me. Hi. Private moment, <laughs> but it's clouding my. Head. 
I'm afraid I can't think of anything else. Um, I mean, I'm going to be honest with you. Right now, uh, I'm playing this role of Harvey Dent. Um, and the way I've had a lot of conversations with the showrunners about where, what, what the arc of the character is going to be over this season, um, and it's like, my God, if, if I love doing this role, I probably should be doing something else for a living because it's going to be it's going to be so meaty and so great, and it's going to be such a fascinating ride. So it's kind of cool to be this. So the answer is present and what I'm doing right now. Um, which is really a cool place to be. It's a, uh, it's, it's a great cast. It's also, it's the, the scripts I really love so far, but in particular, the narcissist in me really loves this particular role. Um, and I, I can't wait to really get into the juicy stuff of it. Um, yeah. I can't tell you anything about it, so it doesn't make a great story. But, yeah. Do we, do we have time for one more question? Okay, one, one more, last question. Shelby, um, my question for you is, which side of your face do you really have to knock off? That's a good question. That's a really good question. Um, this one? Yeah. It's nice, it's nice to come probably this one. I told them about the tattoo of my face that I have on my own ass. Yeah. So. Yeah, oh, right, right. I think that would probably okay. be a no-brainer. It's really nice that you're able to choose. Yeah. The bad news is you're bad, half your face is getting melted off. The good news is how do you choose? I think I've always, I've always assumed that it's going to be no. this one. Is the other one? The other side. Yeah. 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 Oh, oh shit. I'm shaking my mind. I don't want to do this role. Yeah. It's going to be terrible. That's my good side. It's all good. It's all good. Both sides are good. I think you're going to get the, the, the bottom half of my face. Yeah, so it's about, yeah. <laughs> well, I can't wait for that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm actually doing that right now. <laughs> um, well, guys, how was it? supplements or, or, uh, or vitamins or anything, and right. I just got like a mega dose of all of it. So. That's awesome. Well, um, we always tell people, you're clean. Yeah. You're a clean fighter. You're yeah. a clean fighter. You took Jerry down, <laughs> all sober, no drugs. Yeah. And now, but now I can take Rob down. Now you're... No, I'm not going to take Rob down. No. Please don't. No one's going to take Rob down. <laughs> no one would want to take Rob down. I hope not. I no. hope not. Um, all right, well, have a great time. Thanks, Rob. I'll see you after. I'll see you after. Cool. Oh, I don't think that's working. I just uh, ran into the nurse that gave you the IV thing, and yeah. she said she accidentally put some liquid acid in there. No! So, 
if you're feeling a little woozy, she said, that's what it is. That would explain a lot. Yeah. So anyway, don't be anxious. All right. But um, that's what she said it is. Appreciate it. <laughs> wow.